Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. This is the last lecture of module four. So the module four assessment's already open. If you want to give it a try, I strongly suggest that you watch this lecture first, but this is the last lecture of module four. We're almost at the end, just got two weeks left, so hang in there. Uh, before we get into today's lecture though, some announcements. And again, if you have any questions on grading, check out the syllabus. If you still have questions, please reach out to me. All the grades are posted to Blackboard. You should know exactly where you stand. You should have no question about how you're doing. All right, so let's review what we talked about last time. So over time, the neck frills uh, on the back of the skulls of the ceratopsians uh, generally become uh, what over time? So take a look at the answers there. Uh, for a hint, here are some primitive ceratopsians some of the more basal earlier forms. Uh, think about in your head what some of the later more derived forms like say Triceratops or Styracosaurus, uh, what do their neck frills look like? Uh, and the answer is that their neck frills are uh, larger and in the case of Styracosaurus, uh, much more ornate, uh, much more spiky, much more frilled, much more adorned. Uh, and again, the purpose of the neck frill uh, not necessarily all that great at defense, but possibly display, possibly thermal regulation, possibly jostling with each other. Uh, on to the next slide. Uh, similar to some of the other fauna that we've talked about, uh, as Pangaea breaks apart, as the plates split into the separate continents that we know today, uh, that impacts the life on those continents. The continents are like basically big boats that are just kind of drifting apart from each other uh, before dinosaurs could kind of freely hop between the boats because they were still uh, connected with each other. Uh, but now the flotilla is drifting apart and some of these connections that were once open are now closed. So ceratopsians are found mostly at what time period uh, and on which continents? You'll probably see this question again, perhaps on the module assessment. Uh, uh, so ceratopsians are uh, primarily Cretaceous uh, and they're primarily on the Northern continents. Uh, so mostly Western North America. So remember at this time, there is Western North America, Laramidia, the Western Cretaceous interior seaway, uh, and then Appalachia over here. Uh, separated. And so most of the dinosaurs we've been talking about have been in the Western United States. Uh, today, we're finally going to talk about one Appalachian dinosaur. Uh, and then Asia over here, the Ceratopsians are also there. And remember at this time period, they're probably still at least occasionally connected by a land bridge across the Bering Strait, uh, very similar to how things worked during the last ice age that allowed like the Pleistocene megafauna, like mammoths and those big creatures and us to cross from Asia into the Americas. Uh, okay, so here's the Ornithischian cladogram. Uh, we talked about Saurischia last module. Uh, we've talked about all these other Ornithischians, the basal forms. We talked about the armored long shield bearing Thyreophora. We talked about the Thuscolosaurs. Uh, as sort of like an ancestral form. Uh, we've talked, actually, I guess we're gonna talk about them today. Uh, we've talked about marginocephalia. We talked about the pachycephalosaurs. We talked about the ceratopsians. Uh, now we're gonna talk about these ornithopoda. So what are the ornithopoda? Ornithopoda, ornith is bird, poda is foot. So it's bird feet uh, for the kind of three-toed prince. Uh, of the later forms. Uh, but the earlier forms have four toes uh, and none of them have that reversed backward facing toe like we see in birds. Uh, and so bird footed ornithopoda is kind of a dumb name, uh, but it's an old name and it has precedence. And so it kind of sticks, which is uh, I guess a little bit unfortunate, but uh, not an uncommon uh, thing in paleontology. Um, <clears throat> so, um, in the history of classification, uh, this ornithopoda category was sort of a wastebasket where pretty much any bipedal ornithischian was sort of dumped into here. Uh, at one point, the heterodonts, heterodontosaurs, which we talked about uh, before, 
and the pachycephalosaurs that we talked about in the marginal cephalia, uh, at one point they were lumped in here with the ornithopoda. Uh, and so again, remember that these cladograms, uh, these evolutionary relationships, they're hypotheses. Uh, and it was later saw that the pachycephalosaurs are more closely related with the ceratopsians and they were sort of put off into their own clad uh, and these ornithopoda were separated off. And so over time, uh, dinosaur kind of groups were taken out of ornithopoda and really were kind of left with mostly the duck-billed uh, dinosaurs. Uh, and so the ornithopoda are these kind of bipedal, at least initially, uh, the, as we get further and further along their line, uh, we're going to see an increase in body size and we're, they're going to become kind of more and more specialized uh, into herbivory, uh, probably the most specialized herbivores to have ever walked the earth. Uh, and we also see that because of that specialization, because of that efficiency at digesting plant material and particularly chewing plant material, uh, in a lot of places, particularly North America and Asia, the northern continents, uh, they actually end up mostly replacing sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, sauropods make it to the end in the Gondwanan continents, uh, particularly in South America, uh, but they become a lot less prominent in North American Asia because these hadrosaur dinosaurs really uh, pretty much outcompete them. Uh, they're just better at being herbivores. Uh, and there is some debate about uh, there is a shift in the plants that kind of coincide with this shift. And is it the shift in plants that drives the shift in sauropods to hadrosaurs? Or is it the shift in sauropods to hadrosaurs that drives the shift in plants? Uh, so it's an interesting topic to talk about, but uh, these are what they look like. Uh, very large bodied herbivores, uh, lots of abundant evidence that they traveled together in herds and migrated together in herds. Uh, nested together in herds and were in family units. And we'll uh, see some evidence for that as we go along. Uh, so let's take a look at the ornithopoda cladogram. And uh, we're gonna kind of just go up uh, through here, uh, talking about all these different forms. Uh, we already talked about the uh, marginal cephalia. Uh, we're gonna start here with this basal form, Lesothosaurus, which isn't really part of this group, but um, so Les Lesothosaurus uh, means Lesotho lizard, uh, and that's named after the kingdom of Lesotho in South Africa. So it's kind of similar to like the way that the Vatican and San Marino are like separate little kingdoms uh, within those countries. Uh, Lesotho is another one of those, very few examples of that uh, in the world today. Uh, and this dinosaur is from the early Jurassic period uh, from South Africa. And you see here the size comparison. Uh, here's Felis catus, our good friend, the domestic cat. Uh, and you see that the, these things are you know, very early in the Jurassic period. They're not true ornithopods. So they're not actually lumped in with the ornithopoda, uh, but they are one of the very basal ornithischians, the bird-hipped dinosaurs. They're not one of the bird-footed dinosaurs. Uh, and again, unfortunately, remember that birds are neither ornithischians, nor are they ornithopods. Uh, birds, the aves, uh, remember we talked about them last module, they are saurischians and they are theropods. They are in the theropoda lineage. Uh, and so it's very easy to get that messed up. And so make sure that you're keeping that straight. Uh, uh, if we look at the form of Lesothosaurus, uh, it's very long, very slender. Uh, it's a bipedal dinosaur, a very fast bipedal dinosaur. Uh, and these are, again, these ancestral traits. This is a basal form. Uh, these are the traits of the very early dinosaur ancestors. Uh, it's an omnivore. We're going to see this trend towards highly specialized herbivory, exclusively herbivorous. Uh, but these basal forms are omnivores. They're eating generally like plant material and insect material, and they still possess the dentition for both. And we're going to see gradually over time a transition away from that. Uh, sometimes these things are put in with the Thyreophora, the armored dinosaurs. Uh, again, these basal forms, they have traits of a lot of the different classes that come later. It's sort of a mix, a grab bag. 
And it's very difficult to put them definitively in one bin or another, because again, these lines are artificial. And so where do we draw these lines between these clads? Where do we draw the boundaries? Uh, it's pretty easy to look at the very derived, very advanced forms and know that, okay, these are clearly different from each other. You know, duck-billed hadrosaur versus horn-faced ceratopsians. Okay, those are different, but the basal forms uh, resemble each other uh, pretty, pretty, pretty closely. So it's difficult to make those things. Uh, another kind of basal transitional form uh, Hypsilophodon, uh, it, it translates to high ridge tooth. Uh, and the reason for that is that it, the high comes from that it used to be interpreted as uh, being arboreal, uh, tree climbing. Uh, it does have like a grasping hand with opposable digits, which would be really good for uh, climbing. Uh, it's also pretty small sized. And so it may in fact have been a tree climber, but I think that over time, uh, we've sort of moved away from that interpretation. Uh, but again, uh, here's a chicken and a mouse uh, for scale. This thing's pretty small. It's again, a small, fast, bipedal uh, herbivore, probably still a little bit insectivorous though. Uh, again, you see these ancestral traits here. Uh, it does still have the premaxilla front teeth. It has five teeth on the premaxilla, the front of the jaw, uh, <clears throat> kind of more carnivorous or insectivorous, uh, pointy kind of dagger teeth. Uh, and then when we get back to the uh, cheek area, a lot more like uh, herbivorous, kind of the leaf-shaped teeth. And so again, this is a transition from these this early fully carnivorous form to a transitional omnivore form. Uh, to the later on advanced fully herbivorous forms and the much larger body size. Uh, there was also interestingly one specimen that was found with uh, an osteoderm, a bony plate found within the skin of the armored dinosaurs. Uh, and it's very interesting because uh, if in fact it is associated with this dinosaur, uh, it would be the only armored ornithopod uh, the only known armored ornithopod, but uh, it's possible that it was like a crocodile osteoderm that just happened to get mixed in with there, or it was just misidentified. It wasn't seen in other specimens, and uh, I think it remains sort of dubious as to that it actually has that armor. <clears throat> um, again, this is a very early uh, reconstruction, very early example of trying to reconstruct what this might have looked like in life. So this is from the late 1800s, 1894, uh, by uh, Joseph Smith. And again, you see the, that uh, lizard-like model in mind. Dinosaurs were initially thought to have been very reptilian, very lizard-like, very slow and plodding with the sprawled out to the side limbs. And now we see that that's really not the case. Uh, their hips are designed for upright walking, their ankles with the hinged joint are designed for upright walking as opposed to the flayed out joints like in crocodiles and lizards. Um, and so again, we see that, that uh, reflected in the art of the time. Uh, the next one we're gonna talk about is uh, Orodromius. Orodromius translates to mountain runner. Uh, and this is a reference to Egg Mountain, which is where it was discovered. Uh, Egg Mountain is this uh, locality in Montana it's uh, late Cretaceous in age, and that's where Orodromius was discovered. Uh, it's called Egg Mountain because there's just tons and tons of preserved dinosaur nesting sites uh, with eggs, with juveniles, with adults. Uh, not so much of Orodromius, but Orodromius was living among all of those others. We're going to talk about some of the other dinosaurs that were present there uh, later, but uh, Orodromius is a basal member of the ornithopodes, the ornitho ornithopoda, the bird foot dinosaurs. Uh, and now it's starting to show more of those traits that we associate with the ornithopods. Uh, we're starting to see uh, maybe a little bit more of a beak. Uh, it's more specialized for herbivory. Uh, and it's actually living alongside of the larger ornithopod, Myasaura 
which we'll talk about later, which is actually a full on uh, derived uh, duck bill. Uh, but you see, uh, they did they did construct nests. Some of their nests were found. Uh, we see again here this uh, feathered reconstruction, or at least partially feathered reconstruction, uh, fully scaled reconstruction. Uh, we don't have evidence of feathers uh, in the ornith ornithis uh, ornithopoda dinosaurs. Uh, no evidence of feathers. No hard evidence of feathers. All of the skin impressions are scales. However, if we we're going to find feathers in this line, we would probably expect it to be in the smaller body sized, more basal members like we saw in some of the other groups. And so we'll see these reconstructions like this. Uh, some of the larger bodied ones, uh, we're gonna start not seeing them represented with feathers because they probably didn't. But again, we can't really necessarily rule it out. Uh, we have skin impressions over lots of parts of the body. Uh, if they had feathers, we probably would have seen it, but absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and so it can't be ruled out, but it, it's unlikely. Uh, next one we're going to talk about is Thescalosaurus. Uh, it translates to wondrous lizard, uh, and if we look at it, uh, wow, it's so amazing, right? Uh, what a beautiful lizard. Uh, it's not why they named it that. They named it because the specimen was kind of packed away in a crate and it was just kind of forgotten about. Uh, and then the person that named Thescalosaurus just kind of found the specimen in the crate and was like, oh my God, nobody described this material. This is a wonderful specimen here. Uh, and it's found in the latest Cretaceous of Wyoming. So again, Western North America. Uh, you'll start to notice here now instead of uh, Felis catus. Now we have uh, a dog. I think uh, Canis familiar. So I think that's the, yeah. Um, it's larger than a dog. So we're seeing that increase in body size. Uh, we're also seeing the beak start to develop. Uh, we're starting to see some changes in the hands and in the feet. Uh, but basically, it's a lot more robust than the earlier forms bigger body size, uh, thicker body. Uh, it's not going to be as fast as those others. Uh, and you see that although it is bipedal, uh, it's kind of trending maybe towards occasionally being quadrupedal. Uh, and we're going to see that trend continue as the body size increases. Uh, there's one uh, absolutely amazingly preserved specimen here. Uh, they called it willow. So a lot of the more famous dinosaur specimens actually have uh, nicknames. Uh, and you see right here in the abdomen uh, a clump of what looks like rock. Uh, it was originally interpreted as an intact and preserved heart. So we've talked a lot about exceptional preservation of dinosaurs in this class and the preservation of internal organs, uh, particularly with such fidelity that you could actually recognize them, would be unprecedented. Uh, and upon further inspection, they did CAT scans and they thought that they saw like four chambers, but uh, the more people looked at it, the more kind of dubious it became. And it's really probably just a concretion. Uh, the chambers are actually probably just septa in the concretion, which is a very common thing that sedimentary concretions do. Uh, the lithology of it is, it's, it's a rock and so, not completely necessarily unexpected. It's it's not almost certainly not actually a heart and some of the anatomy doesn't really work out, but uh, it was a brief exciting period for a little while. Um, it kind of looks like it might be, but it, it's, it's not. Uh, the next and the last one that we're gonna talk about before we get into the kind of more advanced members is uh, Camptosaurus. Uh, Camptosaurus translates to flexible lizard uh, because it, it was originally assumed that its hip vertebrae uh, were pretty flexible, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's known from the late Jurassic of Wyoming, again, Western North America. So we're seeing a trend here. A lot of these uh, forms are Western North America. Uh, we're also, again, seeing that increase in body size trend continuing. So now, instead of a cat or a dog or even like a mouse, uh, now we have a human for scale, and it's taller than the human, so this thing is fairly large. 
Uh, and it's a good thing that it's fairly large because it lived in the Hell Creek for, or sorry, the Morrison Formation uh, from late Jurassic, uh, again, of, of Wyoming, North America. We've talked about this Morrison Formation before when we talked about uh, Ceratosaurus, the horned faced carnivore, uh, when we talked about Allosaurus and some of the larger Allosaurids, uh, and we talked about Torvosaurus, the big Megalosaurid. Uh, we also mentioned it when we were talking about the Stegosaurids. Uh, and we also talked about when we we're talking about the ankylosaurs. So a lot of the dinosaurs that we've talked about uh, from the Jurassic are known from this formation. Uh, and Camptosaurus lived alongside of these. Uh, and so it was coexisting with Allosaurus. It was coexisting with Ceratosaurus. Uh, and it was probably on the menu for these dinosaurs. If you were a large carnivore uh, at the time of the Morrison formation, uh, are you going to tangle with a Stegosaurus or are you going to go after the Camptosaurus? One thing that we see in these hadrosaurs is that uh, they don't really have all that great of defense. They don't have armor, uh, maybe that one, but uh, that's an early form. We don't see it here. Uh, they don't have spikes. Uh, they don't have tail clubs. They don't have tail spikes. They are just large. Uh, and so really the largeness of them, uh, possibly their claws, uh, their beaks are probably pretty formidable, uh, but they're not going to be something that carnivorous dinosaurs are super afraid of. Uh, that said, again, uh, like a wildebeest, a zebra, a deer, like, you know, we don't necessarily think of those as dangerous, but uh, they are able to kick and bite and they're pretty formidable just based on their body size. Uh, so really size and strength was their only real protection. Uh, and the other thing, again, they live in herds. So the herding is another way of protecting themselves. Uh, and so as the carnivorous dinosaurs come in, they tend to focus on the weaker, younger, uh, older, injured. Uh, and so living in a herd kind of helps with that, uh, the, the circle of life. Uh, but again, we see much heavier, larger build. Uh, it's still mostly bipedal, but you're seeing this trend towards they're getting a little more front heavy. Uh, the hands are not adapted for walking, so it's mostly bipedal, but it probably dabbles in quadrupedality where it walks on all fours occasionally, uh, probably also reaches up into trees to reach higher stuff. Uh, it also still has the four-toed foot, and it also has a five digit, uh, very dexterous hand, again, probably for grabbing vegetation and leaves. Uh, and it was one of O.C. Marsh's finds uh, during the Bone Wars. So our good friend, Othniel Charles Marsh, uh, he's the one that discovered Camptosaurus and a lot of the other Western dinosaurs along with uh, Culp. All right, so uh, let's revisit the cladogram here so we've talked about a lot of these forms here. Uh, we didn't talk about all of them, there's not enough time, but we talked about a lot of these forms. Uh, now we're gonna talk about the Steracosterna. Uh, and what we see in here is greatly enlarged nares, so uh, nasal openings, uh, much larger body size, so that trend of increasing body size is going to continue. Uh, a spiked thumb, so if we remember Iguanodon, that's an example, the spiked thumb, uh, the metacarpals two through four are columnar, so like weight bearing. Uh, and eventually we start getting like hoof like uh, on those digits. Uh, and digit five, the pinky, uh, is opposable. So we got a spiked thumb, kind of hoof like three middle fingers, uh, and then an op opposable kind of grabbing uh, pinky, uh, very typical of the Sterecosterna, at least initially. Uh, and they're also just very complex chewers, uh, and that's something that we're going to see in these forms. So uh, this is kind of zoomed in on the Stracosterna, uh, and again, Iguanodon, we're going to see this trend uh, over time as we walk through these different forms. You can revisit this cladogram uh, on your own. But uh, So let's talk about Iguanodon, uh, one of those earlier forms. So uh, Iguanodon was named for Iguanodon means iguana tooth. Uh, we've talked about this one before. It's one of these, those original three dinosaurs. So when 
people were first discovering these uh, colossally great reptiles, the dinosaurs, Iguanodon was one of the ones that they first found. A lot of this science was being born in England. Uh, geology kind of had its uh, birth there, and paleontology sort of sprung out from there. Also, not that other people weren't working on fossils or noticing fossils, but that's where uh, these dinosaurs were named. And Iguanodon was one of the first three. So remember Iguanodon, Megalosaur, and Hyliosaurus. Uh, it was also the first known large herbivorous dinosaur. And so that was the thing that was really different about Iguanodon. Uh, they found Megalosaurus and they were like, whoa, wow, cool. This is a very large uh, carnivorous reptile. Uh, interesting. We have carnivorous reptiles in the modern world, but they're not this big. When they found Iguanodon, though, they are like, okay, well, this is something different. We don't really have or large herbivorous reptiles on Earth anymore. This is a unique thing that's not around anymore. Uh, it really kind of added to this idea of evolution and extinction. Uh, and it was also discovered by Gideon and Marianne Mar Mantel. And so uh, a female was involved in this, which is something that unfortunately we don't see a lot, uh, especially in the early days of paleontology, uh, getting better at it, but uh, it's still, could be better. <laughs> um, paleontology is not a super diverse field. Uh, hopefully we're making strides towards making it more accommodating and that will change in the future. Uh, but yeah, again, Iguanodon is known from the early Cretaceous of Europe, particularly England. And just again, we see the larger body size. Now instead of cats, dogs, we've got a man and a, and a woman and a dog all together for size comparison. And again, we see the, 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 the thumb spike. Uh, originally when they interpreted it, the thumb spike, they put it on the nose because why would you have a thumb spike? Obviously uh, like a rhino has the nose spike. So they reconstructed the nose. Uh, they also reconstructed it uh, very quadrupedal, sprawling, lizard-like. Uh, it probably was quadrupedal to some degree, but it was mostly bipedal. Uh, but we're seeing this like kind of Swiss army knife hand here with these multiple different uses. There's the spiky thumb, those hoof-like middle digits, uh, and then the opposable pinky that was probably used for grasping. Uh, probably not the greatest at it, maybe more like a panda thumb, panda thumb uh, for kind of grasping bamboo. They probably grasp vegetation in a similar way, uh, but we're seeing some of these trends here. Uh, next one we're going to talk about uh, Oranosaurus uh, means courage lizard. Uh, so it's a very brave lizard. <laughs> uh, that's probably not what it's named after though. Uh, it's also the uh, Tureg Berber word for desert monitor, which is a kind of lizard, which they thought it kind of represent or uh, resembled. So uh, that's probably the actual origin of it. Uh, it's from the early Cretaceous of Niger, which is in uh, Northern Africa, where the Berber tribe is from. Uh, if you look at the hand, uh, it looks very similar to Iguanodon. It has the large thumb spine, it has the opposable pinky, and it has the kind of hoof-like extensions on the middle fingers. Uh, again, this is kind of pointing towards uh, these digits are probably starting to become weight-bearing. You're probably at least part of the time using them for walking. As the body size is getting larger, uh, the gut is getting larger to accommodate bigger and bigger hauls of vegetative material. Uh, the more you can eat, the better you are. Uh, it becomes harder and harder to have your center of balance above your hips, and they start becoming kind of more and more quadrupedal, although certainly capable of bipedal motion. Uh, and again, we see the backward-facing pubis, like we see in all Ornithischian dinosaurs to make more room for this big gut, this powerhouse of digestion. Uh, in the birds, which again, remember Sauruskians, uh, they convergently align on that backward facing pubis to accommodate uh, air sacs to bring more oxygen to accommodate the extreme uh, demands of flight. Uh, and so 
the backward facing cubist develops twice separately for different purposes. Uh, in these dinosaurs, the Ornithischian dinosaurs, it's to accommodate the big gut, or at least that's the implied uh, function. Uh, the other thing that's really notable about this dinosaur is these spines. Uh, it looks a lot like Spinosaurus in that it has these elongated uh, spinal spines, uh, and those spines also go down the tail, giving it sort of a paddle-like appearance. Again, pretty similar to Spinosaurus. Uh, they're obviously not related to each other directly anyways. Uh, one is an ornith, this is an Ornithischian dinosaur. Spinosaurus is a Sauruschian megalosaurid dinosaur, so completely different lineages. Uh, it was originally interpreted as maybe like an example of convergent evolution, uh, maybe for swimming. So just like Spinosaurus was interpreted as possibly swimming with that paddle tail and maybe using this, this kind of sail as like a fin. Uh, again, just like with Spinosaurus, that's probably not the case here. So then the question becomes, what is it for? So all the big hitters, thermoregulation, sexual display, uh, maybe it's to some degree protection. It offers at least some protection of the spinal cord, uh, but these things are big, long, and delicate and probably not uh, that great for uh, actual protection. Uh, so that's this form. And again, you see it kind of using those front feet to support its body weight. Uh, moving along onto Myasaura. This is the one that we mentioned earlier uh, from Egg Mountain. And uh, this is a reconstruction of one of the nests and a reconstruction of the behavior here. Uh, Myasaura translates to carrying mother lizard uh, because of all of these nests that were found here. And also found in there were hatchlings that were too big to have just hatched. Uh, they were still in the nest even though they'd been developing for a while. And so that means that somebody, something was taking care of them. Uh, it's an indicator of parental care in these dinosaurs, which is something that maybe we wouldn't necessarily expect for a lizard. Uh, it's showing that dinosaurs have some of these traits that much more closely resemble uh, warm-blooded animals uh, that have fewer offspring and take more care of them versus some of the, uh, like say, turtles or lizards that lay a lot of eggs and in some cases they just peace out and they don't even engage with the young at all. They're on their own, uh, but many more. So this indicates that dinosaurs were uh, to some degree uh, doting parents, at least this kind of dinosaur. So remember that uh, anything we say about myosaurus isn't necessarily applicable to other dinosaurs, uh, but there's very strong evidence here of parental care. Uh, Egg Mountain is in Montana the late Cretaceous, it's the two medicine formation is the name of the rock formation, but it, it kind of spans the gambit all the way from eggs, nests, juveniles, very young juveniles, developing juveniles, adolescents, adults. So not only is this evidence of parenting, but it's also evidence of herding. It's evidence that these animals are living together in a communal uh, society where uh, we see them living together at all these different growth stages. Uh, we also, if we look at the hands, the front limbs, uh, the thumb spike is gone. Uh, digits two to four, those hoof-like digits that were starting to develop for weight bearing, uh, they're elongated. And so you look on this reconstruction here, you see those digits on the ground uh, and you see that fifth digit, the pinky that was kind of for grasping. Uh, now it's kind of floating up here. Uh, becoming sort of a little bit vestigial almost, uh, and, but uh, very interesting, uh, great preservation on all these uh, really insightful into the growth history of these dinosaurs. Uh, Brachylof Brach <laughs> uh, Brachylophosaurus, uh, that's a mouthful, uh, translates to short crested lizard uh, because of this like very short crest on the head. Uh, this is the start of a trend that we're going to see in the later, uh, more advanced, more derived hadrosaurs is that we're seeing this increase in body size. We're seeing this increase in quadrupedality. So walking on the front feet and the hind feet. Uh, we're also going to start seeing this kind of 
uh, elaborate crests start. Uh, this is not an elaborate crest. It's barely even noticeable uh, in the reconstruction. You barely even see that it's there, uh, but it is. It's kind of the start of this. Uh, we also see a start here of, if you look at the face here, uh, the it's widening, the snout is widening, uh, and you're starting to get that duck bill form that we see uh, very well developed in later forms. Uh, this is Leonardo. Uh, again, some of these extraordinary specimens get names. So this is Leonardo. It's a hadrosaur mummy. So uh, it's encased in sandstone material. And when it died, it was quickly buried. And so the soft tissue left impressions in that sand. In this case, it left uh, scale impressions that we can see. Uh, no evidence of feathers, though. And we do have impressions from a good amount of the body. So feathers are unlikely. Again, larger dinosaur, probably not expected anyways. Uh, but just an exceptional preservation here. Uh, you can actually see some of the gut contents here. Uh, it had an intact crop, which is something that was assumed to be present in dinosaurs. Uh, this sort of confirmed that. Uh, the gut contents were able to analyze see what food they were eating. Obviously, they were like heavy into herbivore herbivory uh, and the skin impression, the tail. Uh, and it, it, just a, a very incredible example of preservation here. Uh, Lambiosaurus is a extension of this trend of head crests, uh, and you see that it has quite a wild head crest. Uh, Lambiosaurus translates to Lambie's lizard. Uh, it's, it's in honor of the initial discoverer of this dinosaur, but he gave it a different name. Uh, later on, it was found out that that dinosaur was synonymous, and so his name was invalid. His names were thrown out. Uh, and so in honor of him to recognize his earlier work, uh, they, they named this dinosaur after him. Uh, the reason that his name was thrown out is that uh, initially these lambiosaurs were given a lot of different species names because of the variety of the head crests uh, that were seen. And so all of the different head crests were assigned to different species. What was noticed later though, is that these head crests actually represented different growth stages uh, and also sexual dimorphism. So in juveniles, the head crest was very suppressed. Uh, and then in adult males, uh, it became very ornate and elaborate. And so it wasn't separate species, it was separate growth stages of the same dinosaur. This is something that we saw earlier with the pachycephalosaurs with Dracorex stigmolic and uh, uh, Pachycephalosaurus itself. Uh, but again, it's a continuation of this trend of these enlarging head crests. Uh, we're also seeing the dentition getting highly specialized for herbivory. Uh, the teeth are continuously replaced. So uh, think of like shark teeth, how there's like rows of teeth uh, in the jaw ready to replace the teeth that are being used. Uh, over time with extended use, uh, particularly with grinding plants and probably getting some dirt in there as well, the teeth wear down. Uh, these are able to continuously replace the teeth. They're replaced very quickly. Uh, and so as teeth wear out, they're just replaced by a new fresh tooth behind it. Uh, they have cheeks here. So they're able to keep the food in there. And as they're, they're able to break their food down and they're becoming really, really highly advanced chewers and extracting more nutrition out of that material than other herbivores because they are so efficient at it. So remember like the large sauropods, uh, they don't have these chewing teeth. They had kind of the shearing teeth out front where they would just kind of like bite off whole branches and just swallow it whole. Woody material leaves everything, just bulk browsing, just chomping down huge parts, swallowing it down into their massive gut and the gastroliths in there would help break it down in their gut. Uh, this is a lot more efficient, uh, a lot better. And that might be one of the reasons why these hadrosaurs sort of start replacing the sauropods in most of the areas where they're both present. Like for example, the late Cretaceous of Western Canada in the dinosaur park formation, which should sound familiar from a lot of the other dinosaurs that we've talked about 
already. Uh, the next one we've already mentioned briefly as well, uh, Parasaurolophilus, uh, which translates to near-crested lizard, uh, because there's another dinosaur called Saurolophus, uh, and it was sort of like, looked pretty close to it. it. It looked the same, so it was near Parasaurolophus, or near Saurolophus. Uh, it's known from the late Cretaceous of Western North America, and also possibly Asia. So these forms are present in Western North America. They're present in Asia. Uh, we're going to see later that they're actually also present in Eastern North America. For the first time, we're going to talk about an Appalachian dinosaur. Not quite yet, though. Uh, again, this head crest, this extension of these, the head crest getting more and more ornate over time, body size getting larger and larger over time. Uh, originally, this head crest was actually interpreted as a snorkel, but it's actually closed on top. It doesn't have openings, uh, and it was probably used for vocalization. So they, this lab group of researchers uh, took internal measurements of the crest, and they actually reconstructed what it would sound like. And, oops, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but that's what they said it sounded like. Oh, pretty neat. Uh, you can play that video on your own if you download the PowerPoint, but uh, they created a virtual model, uh, simulated how air would flow through it, uh, probably used for vocalization, uh, would be able to be heard quite a way around. Uh, just as before though, again, we see the sexual dimorphism in the crests, the male have the uh, upright crest. Uh, here you see it's drawn with like a soft tissue flap. Uh, here you see that it's not. Uh, again, the soft tissue is unlikely to be preserved, especially something so delicate. What's the coloration? If it's a display purpose thing, in addition to vocalization, it's probably quite vibrant in color. Uh, there might even be soft tissue extensions off it that we're not really fully aware of. Uh, in the females, it tilts backwards. Uh, a little, there was at one point a little bit of debate about which form was male, which form was female. Uh, I think that's pretty subtle now that the more elaborate form is the male, which is pretty standard in the animal kingdom, but it's not unprecedented for that to be reversed. Uh, oops. The, uh, the next one we're going to talk about, <laughs> I hope you got some more of those honks there. Uh, next one is Hadrosaurus. So Hadrosaurus, the namesake for all of these Hadrosaur duckbill dinosaurs. It is the standard duckbill dinosaur. Uh, it translates to bulky lizard because of its large body size. Again, this trend in increasing size over time. It's from the late Cretaceous of New Jersey, so pretty close to home here in Oswego. Uh, New Jersey is just a relatively short drive, <laughs> I mean, depending on how you qualify short. Uh, one of the very few known Appalachian dinosaurs. There's not a lot of Triassic rocks remaining in Appalachia. A lot of them have been stripped away by the glaciation, and it was primarily terrestrial at, at the time of deposition here. Uh, not a lot of sediments in that age, so not a lot of opportunities for fossilization. But uh, interestingly, even though there's not many Appalachian dinosaurs, uh, this was the first dinosaur skeleton to be found in North America. So there were prints before and teeth before. This was the first skeleton in New Jersey uh, and it's the namesake for all of the duckbill dinosaurs. Uh, and they're called duckbill because of that keratinous beak. Again, keratin is the material of like your fingernails and hair. Uh, sometimes it's not preserved. Uh, it breaks down relatively quickly. So sometimes all we have is the hard part. Uh, but in good examples of preservation, you actually see the keratin duckbill. Uh, and we also see the really highly specialized teeth. Hadrosaurs are absolutely amazing chewers. Uh, one great example of this is Edmontosaurus, translate to Edmonton lizard, because it was discovered near Edmonton uh, in the latest Cretaceous of Western Canada. So this dinosaur was around uh, at the very end when the asteroid fell from the sky. Edmontosaurus was there to see it. Uh, very large body size, uh, compared to this woman here who is doing some kind of ballet pose or something for some reason. Uh, as the body size increases, uh, we probably get more and more quadrupedal. Uh, Edmontosaurus was probably nearly fully quadrupedal. Uh, 
but it's probably one of the chewing champions of all time. Just this incredibly complex dentition. Again, you see these teeth, the chewing teeth up here being worn away very rapidly from this complex chewing process. Uh, all these teeth lined up behind it, ready to replace it with nice fresh chewing surfaces. Uh, you also see the skull, parts of the skull are actually kinetic. Uh, the skull moves kind of in and out. So we have an up and down motion. We have a side to side motion. We have fresh teeth replacing it. Uh, highly efficient chewing, uh, even more efficient than modern mammals. So like think about like elephants, uh, giraffes, uh, large herbivorous mammals, uh, they don't approach this level of efficiency in chewing. And it might be why these hadrosaur dinosaurs really become very diverse, very extensive, and where they're present with sauropods, they tend to kind of win uh, that competition. Uh, and the last one that we're going to talk about is uh, Shantungosaurus, which means Shandong lizard, uh, after the Shandong Peninsula of China. And so this is found in Lake Cretaceous of China. So not only are these hadrosaurs found in North America, both Western and Eastern North America, both Laramidia, the Western part, where we've talked about a lot of dinosaurs from, but also Appalachia, the Eastern part, where we haven't really talked about a lot. We talked about Coelophysis, the Coelophysis footprints. Uh, but after that rift and after the Western Cretaceous Seaway divides North America, uh, we haven't really talked about a lot of North American dinosaurs from the East Coast. Uh, this is an Asian example, and it just kind of shows that these things are really present over a substantial portion of the land mass. Uh, there are even some occasional uh, South American examples, but it's really the sauropods that sort of dominate there until the end. The large sauropod dinosaurs kind of cling on in South America. Uh, but it's this particular one is notable. It's the largest ornithopod, uh, and it also makes it the largest ornithischian. So this is the largest of the herbivorous ornithischian dinosaurs. Uh, it's still really nowhere near as large as the sauropod saurischian dinosaurs, uh, but it's a very large dinosaur. Uh, it also indicates that these Asian hadrosaurs are also very advanced and also very diverse. Uh, it doesn't have a crest though, so it doesn't show the crest or at least it doesn't have any bony evidence of the crest. Again, some of these other forms had a soft tissue crest that may, or at least an inferred soft tissue crest that may or may not be preserved. Uh, possibly this is true of Shentungosaurus as well, uh, because the, the nasal opening is very large, uh, sort of oddly large, uh, which is often associated with some kind of soft tissue feature, like, a, I guess, like a waddle, I guess you would call it, something like that. Uh, and you, again, you see the massive size here uh, in the quadrupedal stance, uh, but also probably a bipedal stance. Uh, they could rear, uh, probably spent a lot of time rearing to reach higher things. They didn't have the long neck. Uh, sauropod dinosaurs, if they reared, they would probably crush their rear legs, uh, but they didn't really need to rear up because their necks did a lot of the reaching. Uh, this was very helpful for these because they didn't have that dramatic long neck. And so you wanted to reach the higher foliage and probably a little bit more bipedal. Uh, that's all we got for today. That's all of the detail of the dinosaurs. We're through all the different clads and uh, we're gonna start talking about the extinction next week, unfortunately. And then we're gonna talk about some individual dinosaur communities. That's all for today. Hope you enjoyed that.